The Tom Woods Show, episode 2315. Prepare to set fire to the index card of allowable opinion. Your daily dose of liberty education starts here. The Tom Woods Show. Hey folks, believing that the end of the world might be a bad thing that we should try to avoid is not a Russian talking point. But if we are going to avoid World War III, it's important for Americans to understand what's been left out of the CIA's narrative about Russia and Ukraine. Coming to the rescue here is my brand new free ebook, Your Facebook Friends Are Wrong About Ukraine. Pick it up at wrongaboutukraine.com. Hi, everybody. Tom Woods here talking today about libertarianism and the arts. We're not very good at this. And there are a couple of dimensions in which we're not good at it. We're not good at doing it. (laughs) And even when we try, sometimes I think we're trying to be too preachy and that doesn't work. And so I want to talk about this and maybe models for how we might go about doing this. And I'm doing so with Mariah Joven who is the author of 11 books. She has her own publishing company. I got to know her just very recently because of a project she worked on for me. And Mariah, I want to give you an opportunity to maybe introduce yourself to folks because you have occupied some of your time on trying to do the kind of work that I would like to see more libertarians doing. Well, I will say this. I'm probably the only libertarian romance writer that I have found. There are a lot of libertarian writers around. They're mostly sci-fi and a little bit of fantasy mixed in. So I don't really know quite why that is. I have my theories, but where we are really lacking is children's books. And I don't write children's books at all. Mine are are rated. So I think that the first thing that has to happen with fiction is it has to entertain. But adults already are pretty set in their ways and they've learned how to read fiction that may not jive with their philosophies, but it's an entertaining story. So preaching doesn't really do much. And it makes for a lousy movie or book too. It's not even just that it's ineffective. It's lousy. Nobody wants to be preached at. Right. If you insist on having a quote unquote message, it's got to be weaved through the work of art in a subtle way, not a sledgehammer. It can be a sledgehammer. And I will tell you why I'm in it. If a story is engaging enough, you can do it. I will tell you this. So I've been a writer all my life. I used to tell myself stories to put myself to sleep or when I was bored. And I ran across this writer who gave me permission to use a proggy term, speak my truth. And she was nothing like what I believe, but the story was engaging enough that I overlooked her preachiness and went with the story. I just went with it. Now, I've always been a forgiving reader, so I can go on the ride the author wants to take me. That seems to be a rare ability. Anyway. Well, before we forget, I Uh just want to say very quickly about children's books. Uh There is a recent release that is a children's book that I would like to make quick mention of. I don't think it's that well known, but my old friend Bill Steigerwald, whom I got to know when he wrote for the Pittsburgh Tribune, recently released a book he sent me a copy of called Grandpa Bear Goes to Washington, The Fantastic Voyage of a Freedom-Loving Polar Bear. Now, I will admit I haven't read it, but my wife read it immediately and said it's the best book in this genre she's read. Now, there aren't that many, but she said the book really works. So I do want to recommend to everybody, I'm going to try to get Bill on, but Grandpa Bear Goes to Washington. And then, of course, I do like the Tuttle Twins book series. But Uh but still, Uh other than that, I mean, it really is slim pickings in terms of children's books. And children's books, yeah, they're hard to publish in the traditional sense because everybody in the world wants to write a children's book and there are only so many traditional publishers. But in the world of self-publishing, it's not impossible to publish a children's book. Well, I was going to discuss why that's more difficult in the children's realm. First, you have a problem with printers. 
children's books generally need to be illustrated or they're just chapter books that somebody can have an ebook of and it's no problem. But the printing resources for children's books are not really available to individuals, especially if they're anything but not illustrated chapter books. Many of these books are manufactured in China and nobody wants a pallet full of books in their basement, hoping somebody will order off Amazon. Illustrators are expensive and part of the entertainment package for children is the illustrations. Yeah. So you're kind of limited to going through a traditional publisher just by bent of having to make these beautiful, beautiful books that you have to pay for the production of and you can't afford it, even if you have a great idea. Print on demand is the only, quote, economical way to come to market, but it's not very economical, especially for children's books. And in my years of ebook formatting and print design, I believe that children's books ought not to be in ebook format, again, other than non illustrated chapter books, because they just don't lend the same experience as, say, a board book or a younger grade book. And then finally, we've got the noise. There are so many people self-publishing that the noise is just deafening. You can't get a foothold in much of any genre. And yet, to me, children's books are where you need to catch. This is what changes culture, is the children's books that really need to be caught. That's how you catch culture is with the children. And I hate to use the word indoctrinate. I really, really hate it. But that's what we do. We have children. We teach them. We mold them. We are their steward. It is our job to send them out into the world prepared to go. And it really, really gives you bonus points if you have been able to teach them principles of, say, liberty, and self-reliance and hard work, that is a really hard sell for adults who are used to being given things. Well, that's true. So you have to make it entertaining first, but you have to get the kids. And libertarians don't write children's books very much. And if they could, or if they would, rising above the noise is the challenging part of that. Getting to the publisher is the easy part. Getting to the masses is the hard part. That's true. They're a clever way. I mean, we know we could do an episode on how to market a book like this. I certainly have ideas as to how you would do it. But I know for a fact, well, I know because we've talked about it, that there is in particular an author I read when I was younger whose work is aimed toward a younger audience. But I think adults can enjoy the books just as much and not feel talked down to in any way. So which author am I driving at here? Older author. You are driving at Laura Ingalls Wilder and her daughter, Rose Wilder Lane. Yes, which, by the way, I've done an episode on Laura Ingalls Wilder because there was that controversy about there was an award named after her. That had. There was some controversy about whether it should be renamed, and I think they decided against it. I can't remember how it turned out. Maybe they did do it. I think that they did rename it. I haven't been keeping up on that, but I believe that the basis that happened was Ma Ingalls saying that the only good Indian is a dead Indian. And you can see why that would be a little bit cringe in this day and age. So I believe that was what started it. So what are the merits of Laura Ingalls Wilder and her books? And what would be of particular interest for libertarians, of course, we know that Rose Wilder Lane, her mother, was clearly in our tradition of thought. But if you read the Little House books, they're not pausing to say, by the way, we should appreciate the miracles of markets coordinating the division of labor or something like that. So what exactly are we getting in those books? What we are getting is the making attractive, hard work, self-reliance, independence, freedom, freedom of thought, freedom to act. I caught your episode on free will. And generally speaking, I am of the mind that free will only exists within the circumstances that 
you're placed. But in Laura Ingalls Wilder, there was nothing imposing upon them that she made you feel like she just had a run of bad luck. They had a run of bad luck. And Pa Ingalls was not, speaking as an adult, Pa Ingalls was not the wisest man who ever lived. But she brought joy to the littlest things. There is this bleakness of their situation and their poverty-stricken lifestyle was over shrouded with a blanket of gratitude and the sense of every single small thing was joy. The books romanticized the grind. You go to work and it's a job you really don't like much. And you do your little paperwork and you go home and you dread it the next day. Well, in my opinion, to avoid getting depressed about that, you need to somehow find a way to embrace the grind. And that is what the books did. It romanticized the grind. Every single little accomplishment was celebrated. If they had no food, it wasn't really said, we don't have any food. It was said, Ma found these tomatoes and she made cottage cheese out of something. We don't know where all that, all those came from, all the ingredients came from. And we had this really fabulous dinner at the beginning of spring when nothing's coming out of the ground and it was lovely and wonderful. So basically you have a little girl finding in her parents and her life these springs of warmth and joy and gratitude that overlies the entire thing. So it's not really a message. It's kind of a feeling. And Rose, who was actually Laura's daughter, she was the one who found a way to make her mother's autobiography commercially viable by turning it into a fictionalized account for children. And I think that the fact that it's for children and that it's so subtle, there are moments of preachiness, don't get me wrong, but they kind of go. They just kind of are appropriate for that moment in whatever book. And children are the ones who were soaking this up and being able to internalize and romanticize the figure of Pa as this poet and provider and Ma as this leader of women who could put together a dinner with nothing, with air. And I think that that is what carried through a couple of generations at least to express the American exceptionalism to sort of define it. And I think that that really made a difference in our culture. I think that the Little House books are more influential than, say, Ayn Rand, who was another mother of libertarianism. Rose Waller Lane, Ayn Rand, and Isabel Patterson, who we don't hear of at all, are the three mothers of libertarianism. And I think that Laura, Laura's books got to where Rose wanted her books to go because they were for children. And that's who we have to teach. Is your opinion that the books by Laura Ingalls Wilder were in some way more influential even than Ayn Rand? Oh, yes, absolutely. Yeah, why do you think so? Because adults, again, adults already have some preconceived notions. They've gone through the whole childhood thing. They've been taught by whoever. They've gone to college. They've learned whatever they've learned. And it takes someone, a reader who is on the cusp of something, who is searching for something, to get a message out of a book like Rand's Atlas Shrugged. And I would argue that The Fountainhead is a better book than Atlas Shrugged. But in any case, I don't think that, well, first of all, Rand is not for children. You cannot teach these things. They are line upon line, precept upon precept. And you have to get 
the kids to think critically about being independent before they reach adulthood when they are, I think, they're independent. There is a quote, and I wrote it down in one of the little house books, if I can find it, that kind of sums this up. She makes certain observations along the way through her books. Quote, we make our own luck, unquote. And then she has a 4th of July epiphany at a little celebration in town. And she realizes that Americans are free. God is our king. No king bosses Pa. He has to boss himself. And then she hears, she thinks, when I am a little older, Pa and Ma will stop telling me what to do, and there isn't anyone else who has a right to give me orders. I will have to make myself be good. And that is something that a child can digest. There will come a day when they will have no one else to tell them what to do, and they will have to take upon themselves the responsibility of, quote, being good. Now, you're not going to get that from an adult who is reading Ayn Rand, who is talking about producers and moochers and looters and why, say, Hank Reardon put up with all the crap he put up with before he went bolt. So you can't really explain. And there has to be an adult who's willing to embrace those concepts, who's ready and willing And he's been looking for something and he just found it. Whereas Little House just kind of eases the child into it, doesn't really preach a whole lot. And it makes hard work, self-sufficiency, independence, and freedom attractive. Because let's face it, hard work is not attractive. It's a hard sell. I don't want to work. Do you want to work? No, I definitely hear you. I will add, by the way, I appreciate your perspective on this because now that you explain it, it makes perfect sense to me that, of course, that's the value, or at least one of the values of these books in that these are things that are obviously being taught in the stories. I will say that as an adult who's read both authors, I wouldn't give my 13-year-old Atlas Shrugged, but there's an excerpt from it that I've read to, let's see, my Boy, I guess I'm behind now. I got to get cracking on this with my third daughter. But the first two of the daughters have each had read to them by their dad the section of Atlas Shrugged. It's an excerpt that actually I'm going to post on the show notes page, which is tomwoods.com slash 2315. It's the story of the 20th Century Motor Company, which was a company that tried to organize itself around the principle of from each according to his ability to each according to his need. And the way the plant degenerates into just mutual recriminations and hatred and disaster is so compellingly told that at the beginning you think, oh, that's kind of a moral sounding statement, but I'm not sure we could ever live up to it. And at the end of her entirely fictional, but altogether plausible account, your view is this is an evil principle that I would never want to see implemented. I remember I read this to my daughter, Regina, who turns 20 this year. I read it to her years ago and she was just on the edge of her seat listening. So I would say read that excerpt as your kids reach teenage years. That excerpt alone, I feel like, inoculated them against a lot of nonsense that's out there. But yeah, I wouldn't go handing them Ayn Rand novels. I would rather have them reading Laura Ingalls Wilder if I had a choice. Right. I can't remember how old she was when she read it, but mine said, well, I have all my books in a bookcase for my kids to just go crazy if they want. So she looked at Atlas Shrugged and went, nope. And she looked at Fountainhead and went, nope. And she saw Anthem. And she said, okay, I'll try this. And she didn't really understand it because it's a fable. She didn't really understand the nuances, but she really enjoyed it. And it made her think. And I think she was 13 or 14 when she read that. So I think for someone who's looking to come into Ayn Rand from, say, or Ingalls Wilder, if they understand the connection there. Anthem is a good place to start. It's funny. A lot of people have told me that. I couldn't get into Anthem at all. I was put off by it completely. I didn't find it compelling at all. I didn't like the way she executed it. I just didn't care for it at all. 
I thoroughly enjoyed her three novels, including the unjustly overlooked We the Living, the first of the novels. I have not read that. Yeah, it's very much worth reading because it it's not autobiographical, but it is about a young woman in the Soviet Union. So there is at okay. least that part of the story. And to my absolute surprise, I just discovered that next month, my local community theater is putting on a production of The Night of January 16th, which is a play she wrote, which I've also never read. And I'm not going to. I'm going to just be surprised. But I'm surprised it's just an ordinary. This isn't like a radical libertarian community theater. It's just an ordinary community theater. And they're putting on an Ayn Rand play. So I am going to go. I'm going to guess that somebody doesn't know the history of the author. I thought that, but then, I mean, really, all the actors and all the, I don't know, I, I would love to find out the story of how they approved it. I don't know. That would be a wonderful, and then you could have them on as a guest. Well, we will see. We'll see. But I am looking forward to, apparently the way it works is there's a jury drawn from the audience. And so at the end, the ending could be different depending on what they think at the end. So anyway, I'm oh, that's looking interesting. forward to that. But let me ask you, what do you think we, and when I say we, I mean like libertarians who have, so I should exclude myself from this, I suppose, who have creative impulses and who would like to do, let's say, fictional, let's say, book writing or film, filmmaking, what could we do better? What would make for a good work of art that also, perhaps only incidentally, happens to advance our ideas into the culture? You really just have to remember the first principle, is that it must entertain. It must. That is art's first an abiding principle is to entertain and to please the senses. Now, what pleases your senses and what pleases my senses may differ. You don't like Anthem. I do. Okay. Now, by the way, I'm very much in the minority. Everybody loves Anthem except me, from what I can tell. <laughs> <laughs> and that's okay. De gustibus, right? That's right. So what needs to happen is that they need to remember that entertainment is its first priority and purpose. Humans are storytellers. That's what we do. We've been storytellers and artists from before we had pencils and crayons or anything. I mean, there's art on prehistoric walls, right? So humans are storytellers. And storytelling on paper is very recent. So it's always been an oral tradition, but humans love it. They have to have it. They learn from stories. They learn from being entertained. And that's where you get the, again, hating this word, indoctrination. But they love to be entertained. And if it comes with the message, great. If it doesn't, that's great too. Sometimes you might not like the message it comes with, but you like the story. And that's what happened to me with Sherry Tepper. She was a eugenicist, and she was very proud about it. But I liked her story, and she gave me permission to write people who thought like me. I was doing everything I could to walk around what these people, my characters, really thought and how they really lived their lives, to tiptoe around it, to make it palatable to others when all I really had to do was let my storytelling come out, and then I found that my audience is lefties who can take a good story and put the message aside. They might like it, they might not like it, but they like the story. And that's what you have to do. Before I go on, let me say a quick thing that will help a lot of you and you know who you are. If you are in business and you're getting buried by your competition online, then build your brand, your reputation, and your lead flow with digital marketing by Persist SEO, our great sponsor. If you're a small local business, you're trying to compete against large companies in the service industry, increase your visibility with Persist SEO. Or if you have low or no leads coming in on a consistent basis, well, website search engine and conversion optimization can help move the needle to a more prosperous business model for you. If you're tired of cold calling, use your website as a lead generation engine. If you're not showing up for your services on the search engines, then get found with Persist SEO's expert search engine optimization. All you have to do is call 
3736 or visit them at ineedseo.help for a free website audit and consultation. That's 770-580-3736 or ineedseo.help. In terms of storytelling, even though I've never written short stories or a novel or anything like that, and it holds no appeal for me. I love reading short stories and novels, but generating them, it's just not the way my brain is wired, but I like when other people do it. But in my writing, let's say, for example, in my email newsletters, but in particular in my business newsletter. So that one you have to sign up for at pathstoincome.com. But everybody else who's promoting some instructional course on how to have a website that actually converts visitors into buyers, whatever kind of training I'm trying to promote, I watch how everybody else is promoting it. And it's so boring and stupid. Really, I'm not going to mince words here. I'm on a lot of marketers lists and their subject lines are boring and their emails are boring. And it's all about, hey, there's this new software. Let me list the 28 features it has. That's just going right in the garbage. Whereas I tell a story. I'm almost always telling stories, which is Mm -hmm. not how most people are doing this. So for example, just this week, I put out a newsletter whose subject line was, Trapped inside a coffin, Woods recounts the ordeal. Now, what? Nobody is doing, everybody else is doing, hey, this software is 50% off, not me. I'm doing trapped inside a coffin. You got to open that. Oh, you have got to open that. What? And sure enough, that's not clickbait. I was trapped inside a coffin. There is actually a story behind that and how I get out. And so I tell that story. Okay, well, my claustrophobia is acting out now. <laughs> well, I, uh, and I, I refuse to tell the story here. You should be on my mailing list. If you're on my mailing list, you would know the story. By the way, P.S., this email I'm talking about is going out in a couple of hours. So it hasn't actually gone out yet. But by the time people hear this, it will have gone out. But the point is, I told that story. And then there's a pitch in that email. That's actually a pitch for a free workshop. But it doesn't matter. It's still, I'm still urging people to take a particular action. But I'm not urging them to take it with an email full of bullet points and you need to do this and you need to do that. It's more of, hey, here's an interesting thing. And it leads into that. If you can master storytelling, you can master not just fiction and film writing, but you can master marketing, sales copy, copywriting, because the story gets people, particularly a heroic story of somebody who had the same struggles you had but then overcame them by doing X or Y, and he wants to help you do X or Y. That sells it way, 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 way better than, hey, look at this great product and look at all the things it does. Eh, doesn't work so well. The story works. Right, yes. And tapping into an aspiration, tapping into people's aspirations. This is why weight loss has worked so well. This is what I used to look like, and this is what I look like now. I was where you are, that sort of thing. It's an aspirational component too. So I consider my writing aspirational. That's what I'd like to be, but I'm not. Most people aren't, but that's what we'd like to be. So what advice then do you have? I mean, given that, as you say, on the one hand, people have tremendous opportunity to get their ideas, their creations out before the public. On the other hand, there are also tremendous challenges facing them. So is the future bright or bleak for them? And what do you advise that they do? It is bright for people who can market or who are willing to learn how to market. You don't have to be a great technical writer to be a good storyteller. I tell people all the time, I can make a decent technical writer out of a good storyteller, but I can't make a good storyteller out of a decent technical writer. Your grammar's all fine. Your spelling's all fine. That's nice. Whatever. Did you tell a good story? And second of all, can you make other people want to read your work or see your work or listen to it on Spotify or whatever? There's a certain amount of luck involved, and I'm not going to discount that. You just hit the right super fan, or you hit the right librarian. That's kind of what happened to me. I'm not anywhere near famous, and my books are so old now, I'm getting candy money. But I got online when Twitter was, oh, Twitter, I think I got online on Twitter in 2008. I think I was at the forefront of self-publishing fiction. 
those were in the days when if you self-published fiction, you were a hack, you were committing career suicide, nobody would ever look at your work again. And getting published was better than publishing. So you publish yourself, you take your own life into your hands and your own career into your hands. I took a lot of slings and arrows for that. On the other hand, I got on Twitter and I started talking. People liked what I had to say. And it wasn't necessarily about my books or anything like that. But people liked what I had to say on Twitter. So they went and bought my books and they liked my books too. That was great. And then they started to defend self-publishing. Look at Mariah's books. They're really good. Nobody else would publish them because for obvious reasons, they're 1,100 pages long. But she's good and she tells a good story. And I like what she has to say on Twitter. And that's how I got started. And that is how other authors followed me into self-publishing, even if they had been traditionally published in the first place. So I feel like my contribution to the world of fiction and self-publishing has been made. I was a speaker at Writer's Digest in 2011. I did another couple of conferences. So what libertarians need to do, first of all, is start writing children's books and marketing them. But second of all, just tell a good story. That's all you have to do. Your message will come through loud and clear. But nobody will care about your message, even if they're offended by it, if you tell a good enough story. Nobody will care. They'll just like the story and say, well, you got to tell it to their friends. You got to ignore that other part there. But this is a really good story. You've got to read this book. And that's where it lies. So when we're talking about adults, you just have to make the story so good that your message can be ignored, digested, whatever. And that can be your second thought. But children's books are where you're going to get your new libertarians. That's where it's going to happen. That's where the magic happens. And that's why I think that Little House is more influential than Ayn Rand. And Rose had a big hand in that. What is your website and what would people find there? MoriahJoven.com. That's M-O-R-I-A-H-J-O-V-A-N.com. What they would find there are my 11 novels. Not all of them are libertarian-minded. So I have one book where my heroine really, really, really loves Laura Ingalls Wilder because she read her at a time and a moment that she had the choice as a child to do the right thing. And she was scared to death to do this right thing. But Laura would do it. So she said, what would Laura do? Okay, so we fast forward through her life and she's now a celebrity chef. She's got her own place. She put it in Mansfield, Missouri so that she could be close to Laura Ingalls Wilde because that's where Laura died, had her Rocky Ridge farm where Rose was raised. So she talks about very explicitly libertarian philosophies to her sort of libertarian-leaning boyfriend who is, by the way, a politician. There's friction with that. The politician, she doesn't want anything to do with it. He's like, can I get elected as a libertarian? And it goes back and forth. But she really, really loves Laura. And I had to do that. I had to write that story with Laura and pay her homage as someone who informed me as a child and still informs me now. So I want to just make sure we get the spelling. M-O-R-I-H-J-O-V-A-N. Is it dot com? Uh-huh. Okay. All right. So I'm going to put that at tomwoods.com slash 2315. And then also talk once again about services you offer, because maybe somebody listening might want to avail themselves of your services. Oh, well, thank you very much. I do ebook formatting and I do print book design and He's only I do cover design, but that's not my forte. I am a book shepherd. I will do everything from content to edit your book to helping you get it on the market. 
I no longer do that for people because it's a hassle and I don't want to be responsible for other people's property. But I got into ebook formatting because I couldn't find any services when I was self publishing and I learned everything there is to know about it. I've been doing it since 2010. And I could not afford to keep my old job because I was leaving so much ebook formatting money on the table. So I've been doing this a very long time. I consult with nonprofits who have publishing arms. For instance, a medical nonprofit who has medical monographs. I run their publishing arm. So I do it all. Wow. Well, given that you do ebook formatting, I guess the audience is slowly figuring out how I got to know you. (laughs) Yes, your new work. All your Facebook friends are wrong about the Ukraine. Yeah. So you can get your Facebook friends are wrong about Ukraine at wrongaboutukraine.com. This, your Facebook friends are wrong series has been so, so good and satisfying. And of course, I get people saying, I have very carefully curated my Facebook friends, so I don't have anybody who's wrong. But I'm telling you, we all have those friends from high school who, even though they've been on Facebook with us for 10 years, haven't learned a damn thing. You know, those are the ones I'm talking about. (laughs) Yeah, and sometimes you don't know what they think because Facebook doesn't show you what they say. Or more commonly, because they don't interact with me, they start not seeing me in the Facebook feed in the first place. Exactly. Maybe that's just the way I want it. I don't need to see old Fred from high school anymore, really. And certainly not in my Facebook feed or in my uh, comments section. You know, I don't want to deal with his stupid opinions. I really don't like Facebook. It confuses and frightens me. I use it because I'm on a few groups of my little hobbies, but I don't like Facebook. I love Twitter. I'm teaching Uh. a client of mine how to use Twitter and it's frustrating because it's like, oh, this is like so obvious. But no, Twitter confuses and frightens her. A lot of people misuse Twitter. Like I see people trying to sell things on Twitter and do marketing on Twitter. On Twitter, you got to be very, very indirect about it. I mean, if Uh if you say, here's a link to my new course, it's going to get zero engagement. There's zero. Because nobody is on Twitter for that. So really, Twitter is just to build up your brand or your reputation. And then people check you out after that. So it's very roundabout. And that is how I got an audience. I just said stuff. That yeah. people liked. And they said, well, where are your books? And I said, well, here, go here. Right, right, right. And of course, for me, email is always king. And I was talking to a guy recently on this show, as a matter of fact, who said that, I don't know how they came to this conclusion, but some researchers found that in terms of value to you as somebody trying to sell something, one email address is worth 75 followers on Twitter. I mean, like that's how divergent it is. Oh, goodness. I didn't know that. See, yeah. I have a blog and I was becoming a slave to my blog numbers because they were going up and up and up and up, but I was having to produce content. And I'm someone who stops talking when I have nothing else to say. So I haven't kept up with my blog at all because I've said it all. What am I going to do? Recycle old things? But I know that in terms of marketing, you have to say something seven times or nine times. I can't remember yeah. which. For it to take. And I can't abide doing that. Oh, I agree. Sometimes that noise the heck out of me. I feel like I'm bothering people. Like that. they've already seen all the times I've mentioned it. But then you have to remember how busy people are, how many things are uh-huh. going on. They have family yeah. and hobbies and work and this, that, and the other thing. And they probably didn't see the first six times you did it. And even exactly. if they see the seventh, even okay, so then they see the seventh, but then they have to think it over and what the person's going to win who is just persistent enough to keep on doing it. Yeah, yeah. And there are a couple of libertarian authors on Twitter who are really good at it. Morlock P., also known as Travis Corker, and Rob Creasy, I think I'm saying that right, K-R-O-E-S-E, I think. But they're, you know, they're sci-fi and... A lot of libertarians just gravitate to sci-fi, and that's where people find their audience. But those two writers on Twitter do it right. And what's your Twitter handle? At Mariah Joven. Makes sense. All right. So I'm going to link to that and your website on the show notes page. Again, it's tomwoods.com slash 2315. 
Well, thanks so much for the chat today, and I'm very glad to have had a chance to get to know you. Well, thank you, and I appreciate the opportunity. And thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Become a smarter libertarian in just 30 minutes a day. Visit TomWoods.com to subscribe to the show for free, and we'll see you next time. Like the sound of The Tom Woods Show? My audio production is provided by Podsworth Media. Check them out at podsworth.com.